All right, good morning. We'll turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 33 through 37. And be reminded as you turn there that this is God's holy word. And so every single word of it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. God's word is inerrant, it is infallible, and it is our final authority in everything we're supposed to believe and do. And so be addressed by God as you hear these words of Jesus, starting in Matthew 5, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word and your son, the word, being made flesh and coming down to be grace to us, but also to unpack the truth of your law, that all of it pointed to him. And so, Lord, that we might live lives that point to you, teach us out of his law your great truth, and in this particular case, about being people of truth, people of our word. Help us to be like Jesus in this respect and challenge us where we have not been. We pray that Christ would be magnified in this message and in our hearing and as we apply these things to our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, two weeks ago, I called that murderous heart, last week, adulterous heart, and then this week, false heart. And you see the the pattern that Jesus is, I use the expression of an x-ray, Jesus is honing in from the externals to the heart of the matter. When he does so, contrary to a lot of popular misconceptions of this, he's not leaving behind the hands and feet and what we do in the world. He's simply distinguishing and saying that you've not obeyed the commandment simply because you avoided doing this or that out in society because the Lord looks on the heart. Well, so it is here. However, this is, like the other two passages, misunderstood in a lot of ways. On the frontier revivals of the Second Great Awakening in the 19th century, for example, as America was expanding westward, the leaders of a new form of religion were vehemently denouncing church hierarchies, authorities. They were denouncing doing theology historically, doing it systematically, doing creeds or confessions. And one of the products of this just me and my Bible or Bible only kind of mindsets was that you can no longer read the Bible as a unity, as something that all went together. Because, of course, in order to do that, you have to use words and language and ideas that are not expressly written. And one of the many casualties of this approach is, the, or was and still is, the banishing of all oaths on the ground of these very words of Jesus. Even the Apostle James adds to the seriousness of this parallel uh, of this with his own parallel text. If you look in James chapter 5, verse 12, he says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. You see in that text, almost verbatim, the same as the words of Jesus here in Matthew 5. Now, the idea that this was calling all oaths and vows sinful was actually not the conclusion of the entire Reformed tradition. In fact, all 
of historic Christianity before the Reformation. This is really a new interpretation that Jesus was um, banishing all oaths. And, and that might, unlike other examples of that, that might kind of uh, explode our minds a little bit because it seems to say that exact thing. But, but let me just give you an example of the historic position. For example, uh, Heidelberg Catechism, written in the 1560s, in question 101, asks this, but may we not swear by the name of God in a religious manner? Answer, yes, when the magistrate requires it, where it may be needful otherwise to maintain and promote fidelity and truth to the glory of God and our neighbor's good. For such swearing is grounded in God's word and therefore was rightly used by the saints in the Old and New Testaments. And so the only conclusion for modern American evangelicals after the 19th century is to look at statements like that for 19 centuries and say, well, they, they obviously didn't know their Bible as well as we do now. That was a conclusion that a lot of people came to because, well, Jesus says it right here, plain ink. Well, here's what we're going to see today. Here's the big idea. If you get lost, just come back to this, that what is most at stake in this false oath is a false heart that fears man rather than God. And we'll see that in the examples that Jesus uses. What's really going on here under the x-ray, what's the real sin here behind this taking of oaths or swearing falsely, is a false heart that fears man rather than God. And I'm going to have to build up to show that. But what I want to do first is to show four reasons why Jesus cannot be calling all biblical oaths sin. Now, I'm cheating. I'm using the adjective biblical there, but I will show you that. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Four reasons why Jesus cannot be calling all biblical oaths sin. And then our second point will be, well, then what is he saying? The real heart of the false oath or vow. So let's look at that first. Four reasons why Jesus cannot possibly be calling all biblical oaths sin. And this was the historic position of all Orthodox Christians, no matter what tradition, until the modern era. Well, the first argument is logical. If the Bible is the inerrant word of God, if it has one divine author and is perfect and never contradicts itself, well, then it simply cannot be that Jesus is forbidding all that we mean by oaths. Now, why is that? Well, here's one reason. Because God himself commanded oaths in the Old Testament. For example, Leviticus 27.2, If anyone makes a special vow to the Lord involving the valuation of persons... And then it goes on to give stipulations for doing just that. Deuteronomy 10.20, You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name shall you swear. Now that's the one that Jesus starts his quotation of when he starts with the law of Moses and then goes into the tradition. By his name you shall swear. Isaiah 65.16, And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth. 1 Samuel 24, 12, may the Lord, this is David, he's at the top of the cave, Saul's chasing him, and what does he say to Saul? May the Lord judge between me and you, and may the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. And in the transfer of power from David to Solomon, on the basis of God's own word in the royal covenant, both David and Solomon took turns applying the oath. 1 David on his deathbed in 1 Kings 1, 29 and 30. And the king swore, saying, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, even so will I do this day. 1 Kings 2, 23, now Solomon. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God, do so to me and more also if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. By the way, you notice a pattern there. This is a hint for later when we look at what Jesus is saying. They all swore by the Lord specifically, either recalling something he had said or something he had done. Now, some, from these and others, if the prohibition against these oaths were really universal, 
Jesus would be assaulting the very law of his father, really his own law, as he is God. But it will be answered that the words of Matthew 5 plainly say, do not take an oath at all. Stop. Do not take an oath at all. And that Jesus has a right to abrogate in the new what even God has ordained in the old. And that might seem reasonable at first glance, but there's just one little problem with it. And the first problem with that argument is that one reason that Jesus gives here for this rule in Matthew 5 is that, quote, anything more than this comes from evil, verse 37. Not that it comes from the outmoded, not that it's merely outdated, not that I said that and that was good, but that was the shadow and what I really meant was this, but that it comes from evil. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem is that because if any oath at all were evil per se, and if its source was evil, and if God ever commanded it at all, then God would be evil. Logically, then, this option is absolutely overruled. It cannot mean that. Here's the second reason it can't mean that. The second argument is covenantal and legal. As we've seen about the other commandments... This law of speech belongs to the moral law. It's not something simply in the ceremonial law that can be done away with. So it cannot belong to that category of commandments that can be entirely abrogated. Two commandments are relevant here, and you see this throughout the Pentateuch when it's mentioned in the Old Testament. The third commandment, that is using the Lord's name in vain, and the ninth commandment about false witnesses, because, of course, where would you swear or on what basis would you swear when you were giving testimony in a court in Israel? You would do so by God. Now consider what this means. The third and the ninth are both moral law. It belongs to the image of God that all of our speech is ultimately God's property. We render all of our speech to God alone, ultimately. And that's not peculiar to the priestly people of Israel. This has to do with the image of God. Now, here's another problem in that same category. The whole covenant ratification in the Old Testament, whenever God would make a covenant with his people, and you see it specifically in Exodus 24 and at the end of Deuteronomy, the people were bound by oath to God and forbidden from forming alliances and treaties with other nations. And so they took an oath or a vow to God alone, not to the Assyrians, not to the Egyptians, or anything else. And again, this is more clues as to what God is actually saying is wrong here versus our words and our oaths being to God alone. Now, the third argument is more textual in the New Testament. So now we're going to have the whole New Testament as the context. Remember, that argument is, okay, I can see that, and of course, it wasn't evil for God to command that, but... Of course, Jesus can change things in the new. Well, another problem with it is the new. In the New Testament, we see other lawful oaths. In Romans 9, Paul appeals to God to even lose his own salvation for his kinsman's salvation. In the introduction to that letter in Romans, Romans 1, 9, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. So he calls God as his witness about his own ministry. Or even about something might seem to us trivial as correcting his critics on his travel plans. In 2 Corinthians 1.23, he says, But I call God to witness against me. So you have the Holy Spirit inspiring oaths throughout the New Testament through the New Testament writers. What are you going to do with that? And so you can't simply say, well, that was just Old Testament. And the answer, by the way, to what do you do with that is you accept it as God's own word. You've, in other words, you factor it in to your interpretation of Matthew 5, 33 and 37. And you have to say to yourself, I must be taking this out of context then. Here's the fourth reason you can't do that. And it's in the text itself. The word for swear falsely here in Matthew 5, 33 is one word, epiorkeo which has the same root word as the root word for oath. It can mean oath. But that word and that concept is used in the quotation in Leviticus 19.12. And that verse distinguishes between a true oath to God's name and the essence of the false oath. I don't have this in my notes, but you remember a couple weeks ago, the King James makes a mistake here in the commandments 
in the sixth commandment when it says thou shalt not kill. It should be thou shalt not murder. And the other English translations do this because in the Hebrew, there's two distinct words and it actually matters. It means something different. And so it is here. The words of Jesus that follow assume that his audience knows the difference between these words and the pattern of those laws. And so he lays out all the false objects in verse 34 and 35 in the words that follow. In other words, he's, he's doing a little process of elimination. Not this, not this, not this. In other words, not heaven. Don't swear to heaven as if that's above God, because that's God's throne room. He's above even it. Not Jerusalem as if Jerusalem is above God, because that's his city. He's above that too. And so what is Jesus doing here? Jesus is not changing the moral law of our word being owed to God. He's saying in a very pointed way to an audience that already understood that moral law distinction. And so clearly the word oaths here was being attached to all of those things less than God. And so what's the upshot? Well, the upshot is that we owe our oaths and vows and highest commitments to God alone. Now, we, we promise, and we're going to talk about, well, okay, so how does that factor into things like weddings or elders taking oaths or, or membership vows? That's a controversial one, or things like that. How, how does that come into play? Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, by the way, and I won't read this whole thing, but just as a little, um, if you're interested, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 22, has a whole section devoted to lawful oaths and vows. And so if you want to just study up more on this, you should read that to get the sense of how the whole modern Reformed tradition has held this view, and in fact, all of Christendom held this view before the more modern radical position that said, no, 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 just give me Bible. But what just give me Bible meant is that I can just cherry pick. I can just open my Bible randomly and just stick my finger in the wind, and that's, that's what it says there in the text without any appreciation of context, without any appreciation of what these words meant in the Old Testament and what they keep meaning throughout the New Testament. So if that's not what Jesus is doing, what is he doing? Well, we give a hint of it in ruling out those other things, but just like with murder and adultery, he's zooming in the lens, he's getting into our hearts, and he's, he's reading our mail and he's saying, okay, this is what you're doing when you're making all these vows. Let's look at the form of the text itself. It might help us to know that in Koine Greek, just like in other ancient languages, they didn't have our elaborate uh, punctuation system like we have. And so we supply that in the English, and that's totally fine. But there's no comma after the words at all. There's certainly no period or exclamation point or mic drop or you know all the things that we want to put into it, some big pause and say no oaths, period. And it's fine that there's one in the English, that that's proper syntax in an English sentence. But if you understand the context, when you run into these words in verse 34 and 35 that follow that, either this or this or that, there's really two ways you can read that sentence. So just as a little exercise, let me read it in two totally different cadences. First, I'll read it the right way. And then I'll switch up the pace a little bit just to give you a sense of how you can understand. I'm not, certainly not making fun of the other view. Um, it's an understandable thing to do if you don't understand the context. First, there's the right way. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. You see what I did there? I just kept going because that's what the Greek does because that's what Jesus is doing. He's making those clauses of what he means by oaths. He's not departing and going on to another subject. Let me read it now again the wrong way. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. So I won't do this in court. So I won't have a public wedding. That's such a secular invention. So we won't have church membership and promise anything to each other. Well, not so fast, but there's all that. Either by heaven, as you read the Bible later or whatever else for devotional purposes, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth for this. And see, the point is, there's no point to read the rest of the sentence if you take that position. 
because this is not unpacking what he's talking. Now, someone from that argument could say, well, no, he's adding those things for emphasis. So he's being emphatic by drawing out all those things. And one of the things I would say is that, no, he's not making it emphatic on your view. He would actually be making it superfluous. He would be adding those things for no particular reason. For example, if your view is really correct, if this is banning all oaths and he's using these examples, well, according to that view, why wouldn't he use the examples of the thing that you're excluding? Why wouldn't he say, and I mean God too, and I mean those ones back in the Old Testament. I'm getting rid of those. And I mean no more public weddings. And I mean no, you know, you see what I'm saying here? If that view is correct, it wouldn't, isn't it odd they didn't use those as examples rather than all these things in creation as his examples? And so we get another clue from what might seem like a silly example right after, but it's not. Verse 36, and do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. You think, well, that's, that's an odd example. But if you think about it, we actually do that all the time in the modern world. We, uh, we swear by the, by the hair on our chinny-chin-chin. Chin. I swear on my mother's life. I, I, I cross my heart. Pinky, pinky promise. Um, I swear on a stack of Bibles. We say things like that. What are we doing when we do that? We're, we're turning the, the heat down to simmer. That's what we're doing. We're saying, I'm going I'm to be serious about this. My pinky. Yeah, that's serious. The hair on my chinny chin chin. No, 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 I'm going I'm to up the ante. I'm going to, on my mother's life. No, 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 I'm going to, I'm on a stack of Bibles. Actually, we're still cheating. And this is Jesus' point. None of those things can rise up and testify against you. And even if they could, none of those things could hold you accountable because they lack the power. And so actually, We're cheapening words. We're cheapening promises. We're hiding from the greater sense of our duties. As if these things could bind us by watching us or by taking vengeance on us. The Heidelberg Catechism continues in the very next question and the one that I read at the beginning. In question 102, it says, May we swear by the saints or by any other creature? Answer, no. For a lawful oath is a calling upon God as the only searcher of hearts to bear witness to the truth and to punish me if I swear falsely, which honor is due no creature. So what they were doing there really is unpacking the meaning of Matthew 5, 33 through 37. In other words, our big idea, what is most at stake in this false oath is a false heart that fears man rather than God. When we try to make promises or do serious commitments, but then we, we, we keep God out of it. And we don't say, well, no, leave God out of this, but actually that's what we're doing. When we do that, we're lowering our fear from a fear of God to a fear of man. But it's even worse to exalt all those created things above God when you still use God's name in some way because that is a brazen act. And that's what the third commandment is getting at. Calvin adds here in his commentary that God's name is comprehended in the heavens, the earth, the temple, the altar. So all of our attempts to hide from God, like most obviously I I swear on a stack of Bibles or something that's, that's holy, those things comprehend God's name. You'd be surprised all of the ways that we can violate the third commandment to use his name in vain when we attribute to created things, things that really only belong to God. So that to even think about pinning one's vows down to anything less than God is already to violate that commandment in the heart. It is God alone to whom our word is ultimately due. And so as the Westminster Confession of Faith says in that section, the name of God only is that by which men ought to swear. And again, that Deuteronomy 10, 20 text that Jesus is quoting, it says... And so, for example, you you have to stick with that consistent interpretive principle that that Jesus is not saying about what Moses said, Moses is wrong, because God inspired those words through Moses. Jesus is always giving a corrective to the rabbinical tradition that had grown up around that. 
And so with the Pharisees, and we don't know all of what they were doing, but in some way they were building some hedge around God and saying, well, no, 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 let's leave God out of this because we want to be reverential. I'm sure they had some reverential reason for, for doing whatever it is they did. But whatever it was, they transferred our promises from God to other things. As Jeremiah 5, 7 says, you have sworn by those who are no gods. And so that was the idea. And then there's finally those last words in verse 37. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Some translations say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We say that in popular language. What are we trying to say when we say that? We say, be a person of your word. You promise something, you do it. And, And really what's going on here is that if we are a people of our word, we wouldn't need to dress it up like this. Now, there's a distinction here between things that are of a public matter, where an oath is appropriate, versus our everyday speech, and Jesus is really driving at our everyday speech. Now, if you want to know more about this, Psalm 15 is a critical text for understanding this expression, because there you have a picture of the ideal. You have the picture of the righteous citizen, someone who will dwell in God's holy hill. And one of the attributes in Psalm 15, verse 4, of such a person is that he is one who swears to his own hurt and does not change. In other words, he makes a promise and he lives up to it even if it hurts him, even if it makes him look like a fool, whatever it is. He takes his promises seriously and he follows through. So let's apply this to our lives. And the first thing that this applies to is, is, um, is correcting doctrine. Uh, correcting different traditions, because uh, let's face it, if we, um, if we have not understood this text, a big part of the reason might be the tradition we come from. And throughout church history, there's been different ways to get this wrong. Rome, for example. Rome combined violations of the second and the third commandment because for centuries they would have people making oaths to relics or to the saints, The bodies of the saints and the relics were objects of vow-making. Francis Turretin has a great statement against Rome at this point in his section on the third commandment where he says, We deny that they should receive religious worship. We deservedly turn away from the superstition by which, through sheer fraud to make sport of the people, the relics of the apostles are shown while their writings are concealed. The relics are mute, and there's no danger of their muttering anything against the Pope, but the apostolic writings strangle the papacy and overthrow idolatry. So, you know, why do you think Rome is having people make oaths to, you know, whatever it is, the bones of the apostles or whatever else? Well, their bones can't talk and get up and say, no, wait a minute, I am Peter and Paul, and I'm going to tell you something right now. You guys are getting all this stuff wrong. But while they're doing this with the bones of the apostles, they ignore their writings, which are everywhere right in front of us and crystal clear that Rome is in sin. Now, on the other extreme, you had the Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists refused to take oaths at all. That's why the Reformed tradition was writing so much about this. And they used these words of Jesus so that no one could hold them to anything in either church or state. And so it it, it undid the very fabric of society. And so the Reformed tradition spent a lot of time talking about this. And so we can see why the Reformed documents had to steer between these extremes of Rome, who was swearing to everything, and the Anabaptists, who wouldn't swear to anything. But the Reformers understood that human beings are pathological liars by nature. And God has given us speech partly as a medium to keep us all honest. Now, it doesn't deal with our heart, but it's a way in which human beings are held accountable to God and to each other before God. Now, what is this about letting our yes be yes and our no be no? How does that affect us in real life? Well, if we're a people who are known for keeping our word, and sadly, a lot of times in society, Christians are not known for keeping their word. And Christians have to be a people who, when the world looks at us, they say, that guy's an honest guy. He says he's going to show up, he shows up. We shouldn't have to appeal to anything other than our own word. 
in everyday arrangements. Now, matters of public record are different. You know, you have your trials in court. You have officers in the church. And, of course, you have weddings. These have reasons why there's a public witness. But what Jesus is driving to our lives here is that we should be a people who don't need to dress up our words because when people know us, they know they can count on our word. Ephesians 4.25, Paul says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now, the gospel is here. You might be surprised. And by the way, here's another reason why I can't get rid of oaths, because it's not just that God commanded oaths of human beings in the Old Testament. God himself swears. And in fact, he saves by swearing. God made an oath in the gospel, and it's what makes it good news, and it's what makes it certain. If you look in Hebrews chapter 6, the author of Hebrews explains that this was the case all the way back in the beginning of the covenant of grace when God was first announcing this and promising this to Abraham, and especially back in Genesis 15, and that's where God himself makes an oath. He binds himself. But the author of Hebrews says this, in verse 17 of Hebrews 6, So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So if you ask me about the gospel, how did God prove that promise? The answer is with the blood of his own son. If you ask me, how did God prove his word? By sending the word to stand in the place of our false hearts with his true and perfect promise. In Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the blood of your Son. That it has sealed our pardon. That it has proven your promise. That you are a God who proves your word. That we, when we are faithless, you remain faithful. For you cannot deny yourself. So we thank you for this. We pray that we would be a people of truth a people of a true word, that we would follow through on our promises, that we would use all of our speech to take things more seriously and not less, and that in all things we would honor you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.